Inspiration is multidimensional. As tempting as the concept itself, so is every experience that adds to it. I have lived a very multicultural life. I'm someone who wears a steel armor. But deep down, I'm a romantic. I admire the fallen leaves of autumn. I love to express from within. And I love a cup of coffee. I'm enchanted by trivia as much as by accomplishment equally. I was groomed to value things irrespective of content or kind. Hi everyone, thank you for the wonderful introductions. I am Tanzala Mukhtar and I'm connecting with you from San Francisco. I am a PhD in neurobiology and I'm currently working as a postdoctoral researcher in University of California, San Francisco. I was born in Kashmir and I have been away from home for almost 15 years now. It's a child's nightmare to be born in a conflict, being at the crossroads of civilizations with traditions dating back thousands of years. My homeland has seen minuscule growth over the past decades. Stagnation in every morsel, be it system, reform, culture, tradition. It's a child's nightmare to live through such crises, especially a child who loves education and activities. I was such a child. You know, when I was in school, there were instances when our schools will be closed and we would realize it when we reached the campus. And there were times when we were in the campus and we were not allowed to go out because it wasn't deemed secure for us to leave the campus. I was one child who was often demotivated by this divergence in my state. And unfortunately, the same condition continues right now. I think it's the limited resources that made me a calculated planner. And I was always ahead of time planning the next step. And it was in class ninth I represented Kashmir along with a few others and I had chance to uh, visit Rashtrapati Bhavan. And we met on a Children's Day Eve, we met uh, the then Indian president, Dr. Kalam. So imagine my fascination. I was someone who always loved science and research and I was meeting a real scientist. And I asked him a question. I asked Dr. Kalam that when he was a child, did he ever think that he will be the president of such a big country? He replied when he was a child, he often used to ask his mom, how did birds fly? I thought with myself, how insightful. I always knew from the beginning that I loved research and science and I would take up research for my career because I am inquisitive by nature and I want my answers. I was fascinated by biology during school. When I did my undergrad in Bangalore, I studied biotechnology, botany and chemistry. But along with studies, I also completed my BNC certificate in NCC. I remember I was in one Karnataka girls battalion in the army wing. And when I, I mean, during my NCC, we also were assigned different camps and I was sent for hospital attachment training camp. And it was during one of these camps, um, we were at command hospital Bangalore and I was assigned to a cancer ward to tend to terminally ill patients. It was during this experience, which was so heart wrenching and it literally made me understand that I was so compassionate, I needed my avenues. I needed to give it the right shape. And when I went to England for my master's, it is then I won, won the HSBC Chevening Scholarship. I did my master's in um, stem cell and regenerative medicine. I studied the brain stem cells. It was here I actually found my niche and I found the passion that how much I was fascinated by brain, truly called as the final frontier of science. I continued studying the brain stem cells during my PhD as well. During my PhD in Switzerland, we studied how the forebrain is formed. So brain in humans is composed of billions of functionally distinct neurons. So the question is how this complicated organ is formed from a sheet of cells. 
These sheet of cells are called the neuroepithelial cells. And over time, these cells, they divide, they differentiate, change, and give rise to so many different neurons, which become functionally distinct, but at the same time make so many different connections. Around the globe, there are so many labs working together to solve one question at a time of this fascinating puzzle, the brain. How the proteins are interacting with each other, how the proteins are interacting with DNA, so on and so forth. We as a consortium as well made a huge uh, resource for the field and that's in the pipeline for publication. But the question is, why is it interesting to study brain in the first place? Why should we study the development of the brain? How do we harness the potential of this research? How does it benefit society as a whole? First of all, for us who are interested in understanding the brain development, it's fascinating because we want to learn how the tissue is formed, how the cells are interacting with each other. But overall, what is interesting is to understand the molecular and cellular basis of neural disease. For example, autism, which is a developmental disorder. How do we understand a non-diseased or a diseased comparison? Like, how do we understand the brains? Unless we know what happens in a non-diseased brain, we need the comparative analysis of both. Take an example of Parkinson's disease. We know so many people in our lives, you know, who suffer from neurodegenerative disease. These are very common. My grandmom had Parkinson's. Imagine we take, I mean, these days we can take skin cells from a patient who has Parkinson's disease. We can uh, reprogram these uh, skin cells. We can change them into stem cells. And we can then change them to the neurons which degenerate in Parkinson's disease. Then we can give small molecules or drugs to these neurons. And we can study that which small molecules or drugs can actually alleviate the disease symptoms. So this is a way for drug screening for Parkinson's disease. In future, maybe we are able to transplant the neurons which we are growing in the lab back into the patients. Of course, these experiments are tricky and they need a lot of trials and they need consolidated evidence before we can proceed. You know, every day I go to lab, I'm fascinated, not just by my own work, but every time I interact with my professor, with my colleagues, everyone is working on something exciting. Everyone is working on something that's amazing. Working at this interface of basic biology and translation is something we consider as giving back to society in some form or the other. When I was young, you know, I recall how I have started. My parents wanted me to become either, uh, like take up medicine or en um, engineering. They, my dad also gave me an option of becoming a bureaucrat. Public administration was an additional option given to me. In Kashmir as well, like in rest of India, people uh, expect your parents being protective of you. They expect you to uh, take up careers where you get settled quicker. And the basic expectation, because we also have a patriarchal society, this expectation, this mindset people have, the ever lingering expectations of a society from women to maintain a household, to procreate, to always try to strike a balance. If you're allowed to work, they want you to strike a balance between your work and your personal life. There are always expectations from a woman. And that is what I have been suffering and I have suffered as well. In academia, it's not very easy for a woman to survive. Someone who's from a humble background, who had to fight, who had to actually be a rebel to be where I am. And I know there are so many people who will have similar stories. And I know that how much I love research and science. I know I would have been a very unhappy version of myself if I was doing any other thing but research. You know, there was one thing that motivated me when I was growing up and, you know, during my fight, or I would say like, you know, it was my fight against society, against the norms. And that was that every time someone did not have faith in me, I took that as a challenge. It was that negative reinforcement that pushed me more than that positive encouragement. So every time somebody tells you, you can't do something, you do it and you make it possible. 
I was lucky that I got a few fellowships because those fellowships proved to be the launching pads for me. I have been through struggles and hardships and I want to be the patron of education and work for women empowerment. I want to earnestly encourage young girls, youngsters to take up careers in science and research. I want to encourage them to not give up on their dreams and to voice their opinions loud and clear. I want to encourage them to think about their differentiations, think about their failures, because there will be instances where you'll feel weak, where you'll feel there are impediments, there are roadblocks, people will not believe in you, people will do everything to pull you down. There will be people who will dishearten you. But there will be emotional breaks at every step. But there is one thing that stays with you, and that is your resilience. If there's one thing that stays with you, that is your tenacity and your determination. You have to focus on things which are progressive. You know, I started my talk by saying that inspiration is important and it's tempting because I'm someone who is inspired by everything around me. I learn from everything around me. I have learned from everyone around me. I think hope and inspiration come to life in different forms. We just need to look around. We just don't need, as a group, as a society, we don't need to feed into the patriarchy, but we need to provide avenues and support. We need to make trails for those youngsters, those women who need our encouragement. I see myself as a butterfly. I'm still cocooned. But I'm trying to open onto this world and spread my wings. I desire to make a difference. And I want to make every bit of my story exciting. And I want to make every day of my life accomplishing. Thank you.